Kia ora, welcome to Parliament TV. Over the next hour, we present items from the TVNZ collection, from archives held by Nga Taonga Sound and Vision, to remember the politics from our past. Labour leader Norman Kirk was elected Prime Minister in 1972. He died in office in August 1974. The following program, August 1974, Death of a Prime Minister, which tracks the last month of Kirk's life, was based on the book by Margaret Haywood, Diary of the Kirk Years. The program was broadcast in 1985. The reporter was Ian Johnston. August 8, President Richard Nixon resigns. August 9, Kerry Takanoa sings at the Albert Hall, London. August 10, Rugby League Test, Great Britain 20, New Zealand nil. August 12, Protest Yacht Free sails for Tahiti. August 16, Leonard Bernstein performs with the New York Philharmonic in Wellington. August 17, South Canterbury take Ranfurly Shield from Marlborough, 18-6. August 24, storms and high winds close Wellington Airport. August 26, opposition leader R.D. Muldoon strikes demonstrators in Auckland. I wasn't here then, I was in Papua New Guinea training local broadcasters. I didn't hear much from New Zealand, but I'll never forget on the last day of August, switching on the radio for the late news bulletin and hearing it was announced in Wellington tonight that the Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Right Honourable Norman Kirk, had died. I was astounded. I hadn't even known he'd been sick. The next day, several Papua New Guinea students came to see me, black faces glistening with tears to tell me how sad they were at the news. Eleven years later, I have the feeling that lots of people who were here then are still as puzzled as I am about Norman Kirk's death and the loss of the promise that he carried. We just don't know what happened. Perhaps the picture will become clearer if I can go back. Back to the places that he visited and talk to the people that he met in August 1974. I shall be 60 in 10 years' time. Uh, I shall be doing everything I do as well as I can possibly do it. Including being Prime Minister? Yes. Or whatever. August 5, Monday, 10 a.m., Cabinet Meeting, Parliament Buildings. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming back here, 11 years on. I'd be very interested to hear your recollections of that first Cabinet Meeting in August 1974. He got the usual lecture and we got it that day, the hurry up talk. There's one thing missing from there, there's a red uh, folder, which we all had before us with our papers, but there was also the red book. Yes. Always at his side, the manifesto for the 1972 election, and that was the book that was there. Why aren't we getting onto that? Why are we wasting our time with departmental legislation? Like many others, I'd felt that he had got the role of governing the country by the scruff of the neck. And he appeared to want it to go in a direction that he believed that ordinary people had a chance. I remember Norman Kirk <clears> used to <throat> keep on reminding us, both at Cabinet and in the caucus, where our role and our responsibility lay. That he would remind us that we were elected by the people and that we should stand with the people, with our backs to the people, facing the bureaucracy. And uh, Fraser reminds me of something else. I can remember Norm saying to me one day, you know, Patrick, there are two governments. Us and you, meaning the bureaucracy. Yeah. <laughs> I think he found the reality, the economic reality, so damn frustrating. You know, there were things he wanted to do and he wanted to just get them done. At the start of the ministry, Norm Kirk knew exactly what was in everybody's paper and he was adept at taking the paper or the minister or the department apart. And sometimes he clearly did use the technique of allowing the discussion to wander and then he would let people talk a bit about it and then he'd bring them back together. 
But by the time we got to August of 1974, it looked as if the wandering was accidental and even started by him and it never came back together. And I don't think we wanted to know or wanted to recognise in ourselves that, that he was as seriously ill as he was, that we just simply wouldn't or didn't want to take that aboard. Uh, or true, there were a lot of pressures on all the members or uh, ministers around the table and we were tired and um, partially exhausted. But even so, all that aside, I think there was almost a deliberate barrier that, that we drew up uh, ourselves, saying that, you know, it's all going to be all right. Suspected heart attacks. July 1960, Wellington. June 1966, south of Auckland. November 1972, in Bicargo. December 1973, India. April 74, varicose veins operation, Wellington Hospital. May 74, Labour Party Conference, Wellington Town Hall. Now here was a man who had taken Labour Party conferences in his hands and moulded it, inspired it. But on this occasion, he was hunched, leaning on a stick. He was gaunt, uh, the collar hung loose. It was a shock. He spoke and gave a surprisingly good address. Uh, but then he sat, or was seated, at the edge of the stage while business of the conference went on. And that was a mistake. Uh, his jaw began to hang slack. Uh, he was slumped. Uh, it was... Uh, was a show. August 9, Saturday, 8.30 a.m., superannuation debate, Parliament buildings. Mr Kirk, why is Parliament having this long overnight sitting? Well, to have the time, ensure that the minority get the opportunity they want to discuss the superannuation bill. Well, you can't look back at a debate like that without recalling the agony of all those long hours and being aware of the fact that um, Norm wasn't well. And uh, it was a period of considerable stress for him, but it was a period of stress for most members in the House. Long debates are frightful affairs. But I well recall um, uh, the leader of the opposition had... Uh, gone off out of Wellington to attend some prior engagement and uh, I can remember him leaning over and saying now he said they'll crack he said they won't hold firm well, of course he was wrong I, I remember very very well that we worked in teams uh, on uh, the various clauses and people would go away and have a rest and come back again but each clause was debated out and to the closure uh, and that meant two divisions, one for the closure and one for the clause, and the bells were ringing constantly. August 10, Sunday, 11.30 a.m. Superannuation debate continues. Kirk leaves Parliament buildings and secretly visits Kelvin Chambers for medical tests. after some kind of a turn overseas and I went into great detail and followed him through and found that he was a man that was 60% overweight uh, with swelling of his legs which was partly contributed to by varicose veins with a, an apparently mild cardiac condition to the extent that it was a little the heart was a little enlarged but he had a normal cardiogram there wasn't any great cause for concern there it was, I found he was a diabetic and uh, the problem with the Prime Minister who has swollen legs is he's going to be on his feet all the time, so he had to have something done about it. So it was arranged that he should have his varicose veins done. Now, a person of his build is very much more at risk for clots detaching and getting into the lungs, and that's exactly what happened. So that started the, the rot, if you like. August 13, Tuesday, 8.50 a.m., flight 441. 
Wellington, Christchurch. He loved Christchurch, it was his home. He went to school here, he had his first job here, and of course it was his electorate too. But a day like he was facing would be pretty tiring and he wasn't fit. Was he apprehensive about that? No, he wasn't. Um, I think he was a little apprehensive about the talkback because he hadn't met Sharon Crosby and she had a reputation for being quite formidable on her talkback programme. Well, I had to meet him at the front door, uh, you know, as he arrived in the car. Brought him in through the, the doorway, which is very awkward, and up these stairs. And uh, I was a little surprised that uh, when he reached the landing in the middle of the stairway, he said, uh, just a moment, I'll just have to pause here to catch my breath. And uh, after he did so, he moved on. My office, which uh, at that stage was located down here, you can still see the back wallpaper. Um, I decided to sit him down in a suite of furniture that we had here in the foyer. Were you worried at this stage? I mean, they'd rested a couple of times. Did you think you might have to call the whole thing off? Or no, was well, I was it? a little concerned because, uh, you know, at that time I didn't know that he was ill and just wondered to myself, I wonder why he is so short of breath. Yeah. But anyway, he settled down here, had a cup of tea with us. And just about here mm. and uh, once he got into the studio he seemed to relax he took his jacket off and Sharon explained that he'd have to wear these big old-fashioned uh, headphones you know this, uh, that the worth of another person pattern. must yeah, be judged in the yeah. light of that person not his color not his religion or where he came from those sort of discriminating judgments are dangerous and divisive and, uh, they degrade the community that makes them. OK, it's 24 minutes to 11. Good morning, Town Talk. Oh, good morning, Sharon. Good morning, Mr Kirk. Good morning. And I hope you'll soon be restored to full health. Oh, I've been restored to full health a long time since. Good on you. How is Mr Kirk? I'll make my point brief. And it's in the matter of the um, French test in the Pacific. I agree the last Where did he sit when you travel around? He always sat in front with the driver. What did he talk about? everything, how they felt about different things that might be decisions the council were making, and also about things he knew they enjoyed, like him, um, fishing, hunting. So they talked very generally. What was coming up next? Oh, he was going to speak to the Rotary Club. The odd thing to me was that uh, he turned around to me and said, I'm going to discard my notes, I'll talk off the cuff and I wondered what it was to be about. Um, because everyone in the room wanted to hear him talk about Labour's economic policy. That didn't come out at all. And he changed, it, I think from memory, about 10 minutes off the cuff, mainly talking about the development at Rolleston. Good uh, speech? A little low key. I was quite surprised, and I think a lot of the club members were surprised at how low key it really was. But he was at ease in the room. Margaret, what were you going to do next? We were going to go and see Tat Chi, who had a shop just off High Street. I remember Tat Chi once gave him a rosewood god. It was a genuine Chinese god, he said, and it looked it. It was most unusual and little split and very elderly, and Mr Kirk treated it. He had it in pride of place behind his desk and when he transferred over to the Prime Minister's office he personally carried it through the corridors and put it in the Prime Minister's rooms. And I saw a tall chap, you know, big guy standing there and I uh, asked him, well, can I help you, sir? You know, and he said, well, where's your father and grandfather? And uh, unfortunately they, they just gone out shopping, you know, at that time. He said, we would piss him that uh, Mr. Norman Kirk is here to see them. Yeah, and uh, she shook him with him and, and 
asked him for dinner uh, because uh, we want to um, thank him for bringing our families here. He loved getting out of the office. He felt he was in touch with people, particularly in the South Island, because in Wellington you could get very cut off from what was happening here. And he liked to keep in contact uh, with people he knew. And he was on his way now for another appointment. Yes, he'd heard that Ed Paulson had been an old supporter in Littleton, was ill and in hospital. He had been visiting a patient and we had a patient having a 97th birthday in this parlour. Yeah. And he was invited in by the Reverend Mother to wish her a happy birthday. How was he? How was he behaving? He was not looking well and he had a walking stick. Tired? Uh, very thin. Yes, looked tired. Four fifteen PM flight five six four, Christchurch, Wellington. Six PM returns to Parliament. Ten thirty PM House rises. Political progress. 1953, Mayor of Kaiapoi. 1957, Member of Parliament. 1964, President, Labour Party. 1965, Leader of Opposition. 1972, Prime Minister. At the time the house was built, I was only four or five years old, but I remember it going on. It was about the size of this one originally, but uh, concrete blocks and plaster. Yeah. Concrete blocks? Mm -hmm. Well, well uh, concrete and coke and sand and cement and, uh, mixed up a coke breeze block. 1103 of them. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Nobody knows how many blocks are in there. When you make them one by one in a mould you've made yourself on newspaper, on a piece of concrete, the next day you stand them up an edge, two days later you put them in a heap. You count them all right. Really? When you've got to lay each one and they take the skin off your fingertips with that abrasive. And you can hardly bear the touch. Do you remember how many there were? There's 1,103 in that house. And we went round to the Kirk's house in, in Crew Street and uh, discussed Norman standing for the mayoralty. And uh, oh, he wasn't overexcited about the job, but uh, felt that if the Labour Party was to put a full ticket in at the local body elections, we must first have a mayoral candidate. Um, we would be talking about life and what it held and what it didn't and what the prospects were and all sorts of things about our interests. And he would always say to us that uh, you would be what you could see. We've a country that's old enough to have a past to turn to And yet young enough to have a future we ourselves can make Round the corner of the 70s a new decade to understand the part that every one of us must undertake. Make things happen, cause it's your turn now. It's too late to turn your back, the future's here right now. Make things happen this year. It's your turn now to make things happen. For your future, the future of all New Zealand. This November, give your vote to Labour. Basically, there are four things that matter to people. They have to have somewhere to live, they have to have food to eat, they have to have clothing to wear, and they have to have something to hope for. Now, everything, young or old, family or otherwise, everything relates basically to this human aspiration. It may be on a higher or a lower standard of living basis, but essentially this is the core of the matter. He was a man in a hurry. He saw the vision of a better society. He gave himself only nine years to implement it. From the time he said that he would retire from public life or from politics nine years after 1973. And he had lots to do and he was determined to do it. And he was a hard, unrelenting taskmaster. I want to see uh, social freedom, the areas of freedom of New Zealand citizen, very considerably expanded. I want to see the country independent, and I want to see it respected for the force of its ideas and the strength of its convictions. August 16, Friday, 5.30 p.m. Office of the Minister of Trade and Industries, 
Parliament buildings. We were all in this room. The door was ajar. There were no secretaries out there. They had more urgent things to do in here. When there was a light tap on the door and the Prime Minister literally shuffled in uh, with his sticks and stood against the wall there, leaning against the wall, and said, well, Freya, I'd like a beer. And I said, look, I don't think you should have a beer, Norm. And no, I insist on a beer. So the thing to do was to give him a beer and to usher him out. Bob Hyde-Smith insisted on him sitting down. He sat down and propped his leg up on another chair. And when he'd drained that beer, which Norm could do very quickly, he asked for uh, another, which we refused. And Bob and John Driscoll and myself uh, helped him out through the door, very reluctantly from Norm's point of view. He didn't want to go. He looked terribly ill and obviously was in a lot of pain because he was shuffling. And we got him to the lift and down to his car. Uh, I had a bad patch and I was very ill. And uh, it's seven weeks yesterday since uh, I underwent surgery and the complications came out of that. The unfortunate thing is the complications are of a type that take time. Uh, I've been in no particular discomfort for some time, but uh, I have to go steady for a little while yet. But that hasn't stopped me getting in six to seven hours a day at the desk over the last three weeks and taking some work home. The problem really came in when I tried to make him understand what he had to do. He just didn't follow instructions. For his diabetes, he, he failed, and for his weight, he failed to lose weight. He used to have a lot of soft drinks and things. that are 10% glucose. It doesn't really help a diabetic. And although I prescribed anti-diabetic tablets, he stopped taking them without any explanation. And then later on, when it really was vital that he should take his treatment, he uh, didn't take his anti-clotting treatment. In fact, he refused to continue them. And I think this possibly was almost a lethal refusal. Did you ever get through, really, to Norman Kirk? I think I did initially. And then later, when things went wrong, I think he lost trust in me. And I think if I had really been sensible or understood the problem, I would have got another consultant in early so that we could have uh, really forced him to face up to his situation. Can you recall trying to persuade Mr Kirk not to go to Palmerston uh, in the middle of August? Very well, because uh, he was obviously very sick. He was at home in bed, breathless, had to be propped up with pillows. And uh, he told me that he had to open some kind of, uh, I think it was a Catholic school up in Palmerston North, and that this was important. And I remember very well trying to persuade him uh, with his wife alongside me uh, not to do it. And I thought I had succeeded. August 18, Sunday, 11.35 a.m., en route to Palmerston North to open St. Peter's College. But why did you pull in here? Oh, the Prime Minister hadn't been feeling well, and uh, he said, can you find me a spot round here, Ron? So I shot down here, and... Uh, he got out the car and uh, disappeared into the uh, bushes at the back there. Did uh, anyone go with him? Nobody went with him. He wanted to be by himself, naturally. And uh, so uh, I said to uh, Ruth, you know, shouldn't I go and see if he's all right? And she said, no, he'll come out when he's ready. And sure enough, five minutes later, he came out. He was looking like death warmed up, but... Uh, was there any suggestion you might turn around and go back to Wellington? Yes, Ruth suggested to him that uh, we call the whole thing off. And uh, he said, no, no, I've made the arrangements. I'm going to Palmerston. And that was it. I 
rung the night before. I got hold of Ruth at uh, the Seatoon home, and I said, please, Ruth, tell the Prime Minister not to come. He's too sick, and Joe Walting is quite willing to stand in. We under no conditions to be able to, come, to get out of a sick bed. So she said, look, I'll put you through to his telephone by the bed. And he said, it's the last thing I do, Tom, I'm coming. We were expecting maybe just after 12, he arrived about half past one. And finally, when he did arrive, he looked rather pale and wan, but much more handsome than I'd seen him before because he'd lost a lot of weight. And he smiled and acted very normally. Um, then we brought him into lunch, but just before going to lunch, he said to me, Tom, do you mind if I spend a penny? He was away for 20 minutes. When he did come to the table, um, all he could have was a little bit of apple tart, no wine, and soon after that he disappeared again for a while. It was after that that uh, I went for a walk in the garden with in the grounds here with Ruth, and she said, um, I'd like to tell you something very serious, but keep it to yourself. The Prime Minister is dying. What sort of risks was he running? What sort of stress was he putting himself under by going to Palmerston, by doing that job? Well, I think he was shutting the door on recovery because he was a very ill man then. He was in heart failure, quite grossly so, and he was not taking the right treatment. So that he was asking for further clots and, you know, anything else that might happen. I still see the doctor regularly, and uh, he's pretty pleased with me. He doesn't mind you spending six or seven hours at work? Uh, his ideas were for a rather shorter period than that, but uh, there are some things that need attention, and if you feel up to it, well, you do it. By Monday, August the 19th, public speculation about Norman Kirk's health was becoming embarrassing. The Christchurch Star printed a list of his health problems. And parliamentary journalist Ian Templeton sent a story to the English Guardian, wondering whether Mr Kirk had cancer. On that Monday morning, the Prime Minister came here as usual, walked along this corridor, went into the Cabinet Room and chaired the normal Monday meeting of Cabinet. But he went home, right afterwards, to bed. It was the first time that he'd given in to his illness. After Cabinet, his deputy, Hugh Watt, came here to the Prime Minister's office and he gave the post-cabinet press conference. He told journalists, Mr. Kirk has a nasty type of flu that's going around uh, and he can't take any risks. The facts about Norman Kirk's health were much more serious. Medical condition, diabetes, dysentery, enlarged heart, swollen liver, clot and lung, water retention, goiter, ingrown toenail. No wonder the official explanations about the Prime Minister's health were beginning to sound very thin indeed. As always, cover-ups and half-truths only increased the rumour and the speculation. His staff must have known there was something seriously wrong with the boss, and by Tuesday, August the 20th, they were probably relieved that he'd stayed at home, resting, and hadn't come into the office. When you work with uh, somebody like we did very closely to the, with the Prime Minister, you wouldn't notice the deterioration that was taking place day by day. It was people from outside that would say to you, uh, the Prime Minister's looking awful, and uh, they'd notice it. We came to uh, accept that he wasn't a well man. He more or less used to say to us, uh, I'll never make old bones. Well, that kind of uh, conditioned us to the fact that he wasn't perhaps well and we accepted it. Perhaps we shouldn't have, but we seem to for that very reason. Those of us who'd been with him a long time were aware of what a terrific recuperative power he had. That no matter how ill or bad he might be, an hour later he had that ability to pull himself out. Would he accept help if you said, look, come on, why don't you just take an hour off and sleep? He seemed he was such a fighter that I would imagine he wouldn't take too kindly to that. Oh, yes, yes, he would. He'd listen to you, but he wouldn't do much. Uh, <laughs> he was grateful for your sympathy, and uh, but he had that dedication that I must be seen to be the Prime Minister, I must be seen to be working. Foreign policy initiatives. Recognised China, reopened embassy in Moscow, expanded foreign aid, postponed Springbok tour, sent frigate into French nuclear test zone. We're a small nation, but we will not abjectly surrender to injustice. 
We've worked against the development of nuclear weapons. We've opposed their testing everywhere and anywhere. We shall do our utmost to ensure that the eyes of the world are riveted on Muroa and what is planned to take place there. The presence of a frigate in these circumstances will create a great deal of international attention. And I believe that that one action alone will do more to awaken Northern Hemisphere consciousness to the injury that is being done to the South Pacific people than anything else we can do. Well, nobody could be helped but be swept up with the incredible emotion that was engendered when he decided to send the boat to Mooroa and tell Martin to go to the World Court. He was a man who'd only been a Prime Minister a short while. He was this incredible excitement. Things were happening. Here was little New Zealand going to fight the French in the World Court to tell them to get out of the South Pacific. Norm had a great feeling about the South Pacific. That's where we belonged and that's where we should start looking and this is where I think he made you really feel proud of being a New Zealander. You felt there was something worth going out there to fight for. I am convinced that the people of every country are sick of war and the threat of war. Let us begin at this assembly with a concerted call for the earliest possible conclusion of a treaty to ban all forms of nuclear weapon testing. What we have the opportunity to do now is to make a new beginning within the Commonwealth on an equal association of nations. New Zealand is not content to remain a ready piece in a superpower jigsaw. We seek to concentrate instead on the possibilities for common action among those countries which believe that the force of ideas, of idealism and justice should replace naked power and conflict in inter-country relationships. I don't believe he was a Prime Minister that solely wanted to improve a lot of things for New Zealanders. If his philosophy was all embracing to help people throughout the world, those people that needed it most. His concept was, what's the good of talking peace? If you want peace, you've got to work for a better society. Frankly, I am confronted with the embarrassment of having said last year we would not stop the tour and the fact that now I must seek on behalf of government the postponement of the tour. But I want to say also that while I have no doubt I shall be criticised because of the difference in what I said last year and what I said this year, when it comes to a decision between what I must do in the light of the facts that are put before me in the interests of the country and a desire to avoid criticism, then I'd be failing in my duty if I didn't accept the criticism and do what I believe to be right so far as the facts are concerned. August 26, Monday, 4.30pm, Seatoon, Wellington. Mrs Kirk and daughter Robin departed on flight 447 at 3 p.m. to spend school holidays in Christchurch. Well, I was uh, on my milk run in the afternoon and I was coming um, down the street here and when I got to the corner, I saw Mr Kirk uh, sitting on the, <clears throat> on the seat over there and uh, he was looking out towards the sea and he looked most, uh, most alone, most alone indeed and I felt quite sorry for him and uh, as I went past I, I waved out and he waved back and when I went round the corner I thought gosh I'd like to go and speak to him so I thought I would but when I came back I found that uh, he had uh, he had gone. If I'm tired and ill and worried the things I want most are rest and peace. Norman Kirk got neither. August 27 Tuesday 2 a.m. Prime Minister's residence, Seatoon. Lying alone up there, his breathlessness and aching stomach and irregular sloshy heartbeat kept him from sleep. And then late at night came a phone call from Hastings. An anonymous man saying, I know you're dying, you bastard, and about time. Half an hour later, the same call again. 
After the third call, the Prime Minister asked the toll operator to stop any more calls coming through. But he was told, incredibly, that that was impossible. It was against the regulations. He asked for the supervisor, but there wasn't one on duty. After half an hour, the same call again. I know you're dying, you bastard, and about time. The Prime Minister took the phone off the hook and dozed uneasily. To be awakened by the sound of the toll operator's screamer. Another phone call from Hastings. I know you're dying, you bastard, and about time. I felt, well, fancy being there on your own all night, thinking that you don't know what's going to happen, um, and having phone calls. So it was just one of those things. You, you, you do have regrets. You think, couldn't I have done something else? Isn't there something that I could have rung someone and, and, and got done? But you see, that was the nature of the man. He could manage. He'd be all right. August 27, Tuesday, 7 p.m., Prime Minister's residence, Seatoon. Professor O'Donnell, head of medicine, Wellington Clinical School, is called in for second opinion. Why had your opinion been asked? I gather that he had been concerned that in spite of what he thought was treatment that he was cooperating with over the past month, uh, that he had not improved as regards the swelling and again as regards breathing when he was moving around. So he, I think, had become concerned that he was feeling very unwell and wasn't improving. What essentially did you find was wrong with him? Oh, I found that his heart was uh, considerably enlarged and there was a lot of congestion of his veins and his liver and his abdomen and uh, his um, legs uh, behind the heart. He asked me directly that I consider it serious and it, uh, in his state of, the, of his cardiac function, yes, I agreed it, it was serious but not hopeless. He just made it clear to me that he'd worked very hard to uh, achieve his position and he wasn't going to give up easily and so uh, he wanted everything done that could be done. You'd been here some four hours with him. What were you feeling, what were you thinking about when you went out of this door and drove home? I was very saddened, saddened that he, that uh, a man who uh, was seriously ill should be trying to carry on and carry such a tremendous load as Prime Minister. I had that feeling all along that he was um, really wanting to go into hospital. He was very worried about his health. He kept thinking that something was wrong. He say something's wrong, you know, it's... It's not my imagination. I am worse. I'm sure I'm worse. And I felt he kept going, but fighting against the fact that he couldn't be as bad as he thought. The months of worry and sickness and concealment had had their effect. At last, Norman Kirk had to publicly acknowledge that his illness was much more serious than just a nasty case of the flu. He was forced to give in, to hand himself over to the care of his doctors and to hand the country over to the care of his colleagues. August 28, Wednesday, 10 a.m., Government Caucus Room, Parliament Buildings. Mrs. Kirk returns to Wellington. When we came into the caucus that morning and Hugh Watt uh, um, addressed us all at the start of the caucus, uh, he brought us good news. Uh, he said that uh, Norman's um, illness with five or six weeks rest, I think six weeks rest was what he said, uh, would be largely on the mend and that he had been persuaded and we thought this was real triumph that he'd been persuaded to take a quiet period so that he wouldn't be involved in day-to-day -day activities and uh, Hugh then announced the details of uh, who was going to act for whom. What was interesting was that everyone sort of, um, there was an enormous feeling of relief. I know I for one uh, left that caucus very happy. I think the country realises that everybody gets ill from one, at one time or another and uh, that everybody should have the opportunity, those who do get ill should have the opportunity of recovering from that illness. And I think the worst thing that we could do would be to uh, put pressure on Mr Kirk to resume his full duties before his, he's completely well. Now I'm not his physician. I hope to God that he takes notice of his doctor. August 28, Wednesday, 4.30pm, home of Compassion, Island Bay, Wellington. To avoid media, 
Professor O'Donnell admits Kirk to hospital via boiler room. This is where the photograph was taken. I was irritated at the time. Uh, the pressure from the photographer and the man I thought was uh, being admitted to hospital. But it just so happened that one photographer was related to the said Reverend Mother who hatched this little plot. Not that he knew anything, but he recognised the driver of the car and just wondered if it was worth observing what was going on. The, the, the picture the next morning yeah. uh, was very good. Philosophically, I knew that he would prefer not to go to a private hospital, although we didn't discuss that in detail. And uh, it so happened that I knew of the Home of Compassion, and I had been brought here on a visit just a few weeks prior to that, and I knew from physician colleagues the high standard of nursing care, and this was a, a haven where he could be protected from the, the very things that he'd been engaged on over the previous months, uh, much to the disappointment of some of those who'd been looking after him. He was seriously ill with a heart condition, the sort of patient that I would expect would be in intensive care with all sorts of equipment. This was a chronic situation, as you will have gathered. It had been building up over quite a long time. And this is in contrast to the sudden acute heart attacks that, of course, uh, are the indication uh, for going to uh, acute coronary units in the major large public hospitals. He always sounded hopeful, he always sounded interested on the phone. He certainly never spoke, I mean, years before when he was struggling um, and keeping going, or even when he was very tired, I mean, over a number of years he used to say, I'll have an early grave, you see. Um, he had this sort of thing about death, this is throughout his life. Uh, that he wouldn't live long because he was big. But during this time, um, it really didn't come up. He was just so grateful for anything that was done for him. Um, just the normal, simple nursing measures. Uh, like, um, he loved a lot of ice in his drinks. He, needed, he was, used to get very hot and just a cold sponge over his forehead and things like that. Um, he, I didn't find him demanding at all because I just felt that he was so grateful to be here where he was getting the rest. And um, many times he uh, passed the remark about the peacefulness of it. I stood in the door and looked in and he looked much better. Um, that was my immediate impression. He looked very sleepy, as if somebody had just woken from an afternoon nap. So I, instead of coming in, I gave the papers to the nurse aide, and I think I waved at him, and he just raised his hand. And that was it. And I think people who didn't work with him or know him very well tend to sort of uh, semi-canonise him, make him out to be a plaster saint, which he certainly was not. He was a man of volcanic rages. He was a very shrewd politician, with all the connotations that that implies. But he was also a man of tremendous generosity, great humanity. Did he hate people? No. Certain people, I'm yeah, um, qualified, no. Certain people he did. Certain politicians he despised. But I don't think I, can, I know of anybody he actually hated. Some people in the media he distrusted. Some people in the media, he had a vendetta. But I think if those people had come to him sincerely and said that they were in trouble over something, he'd be the first man to help. I think there was a dark, Norman Kirk, there was a dark side of the genius. I think that uh, I'm aware of that. And, and people that were close to him were aware that there was another dark side, but that's not part of other human beings. It's part, not part of us. Yeah, we all have that other side. He had it as deep as, as the top was great, so was the other side. The, other, the underside was unguarded, I think, and, and vulnerable. I think that le left all kind of complications that would follow. But you'd still happily use the word genius? Yes. I think a, a genius with a sense of purpose. Uh, uh, bigger than most politicians, I think, have ever been in this country. I mean, uh, his sense of his own magic. I haven't known great Maori chiefs in my time, but I felt that they would have had that kind of thing, which was unknown in this land, uh, in this country. Take my money, take my wife, steal August 30, Friday, 8.30pm, 
Rata Music Awards, Christchurch Town Hall. Did you know that the Prime Minister was watching it from his I hospital? No idea at all. No, no that's no. right. Yeah. We, we um, didn't know until we received a telegram mm. from him, which was apparently the, um, the last telegram he ever sent. Um, and which, a very special yeah. one for you. I yeah, think, well, you know, I was quite proud of it. Yeah. I, mm. I had it framed. And, what did it say? Um, congratulations on winning the 1974 award. I am sorry I could not be present, but enjoyed your performance on television here in Wellington. Thank you also for the get well message. I will. Kind regards, Big Norm. So that was quite a thrill, really. Because he was in hospital, I deputised for him. Of course, the group were highly delighted they'd won the award. Very sorry to hear that Norm was in hospital and asked me to convey their best wishes to him for a speedy recovery and also their pleasure in having a project associated with them. I said to them, I'll see him personally and convey what you've got to say. Well, I didn't see him again. I could hear this roo, 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 my car going roo, roo, and uh, I never gave it a thought, you see, so we went back and carried on, and it was a few minutes, and Mrs. Kirk came running out of the gateway there, across the road, Mr. Kester, Mr. Kester, and she apparently she had had an urgent call from the Home of Compassion and asked me if I'd run her in. Now, I had a Ford Transit van parked here, and uh, I said, certainly, and uh, opened the gate, and she hopped, and I ran inside and told the wife to get the key, and, and uh, we took off. And uh, on the way in, she was telling me that uh, he was, she'd been up there most of the day. It was quite bright, and uh, she sort of ducked home for her to do something, and she was a very but short time home, and this happened. We arrived at the doorway, and there was two or three of the sisters there. I didn't wait because I thought, oh, well, uh, things can't be that bad. She's in good care there. And uh, so I came home. We said goodbye to Mrs. Kirk and to Robin, and I was talking to um, the sister that was on evening duty, and she was handing over the report. And Mr. Kirk had just been over in the bathroom across the road, and he gave us a wave, and he said to me, I'll catch up with you later on. So we just gave him a wave, and he came into his room, and there was a sister out there, um, his ward sister was typing out there. And um, just after a while, we, she just suspected that something had happened. And um, we came in and we realised that. I want to see uh, social freedom, the areas of freedom in New Zealand citizen very considerably expanded. I want to see the country independent, and I want to see it respected for the force of its ideas and the strength of its convictions. He gave everything for that and died in the attempt, doing what Robert Louis Stevenson said all leaders should do, keeping his fears to himself.
at sharing his courage. Rowling chosen as Prime Minister, Tizard to be deputy. September 8, Nixon is granted a full, free and absolute pardon. September 9, John Kirk decides to accept nomination for Father's electorate. September 25, New Zealand devalues by 9%. September 27, Dr. William Sutton. That look at the last month of Prime Minister Norman Kirk's life was broadcast on 27 August 1985. The reporter was Ian Johnston. In 1987, the Labour government declared New Zealand a nuclear-free zone, jeopardising the ANZUS Treaty. The United States government demoted New Zealand from ally to friend. By 1990, the National Party had had a change of leadership and a change of heart about the nuclear-free status, accepting that most New Zealanders supported it. National won the 1990 general election. On Anzac Day 1991, the National Government's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Don McKinnon, made a speech in London which included his thoughts about ANZUS and other issues of the day. Three days later, he appeared on the Frontline program. Mr McKinnon's just arrived back and he's with us now. Let's talk about the de Klerk meeting first. What did you talk about? I explained to Mr de Klerk that uh, what he was doing in his country had a tremendous amount of interest to New Zealanders and I wanted to get from him firsthand what he considered to be his objectives, his likelihood of achieving those objectives and what were the real roadblocks he faced. And what did he say about that? Well, the roadblocks he faced were, he said, from the extreme right and the extreme left, but he felt he did have the numbers to overcome that. He did say that his uh, a policy of repealing the three, the four pillars of apartheid, that piece of legislation, would be through, he thought, probably ahead of time, as he had originally considered. And how quickly is that? That's, I think he was saying, early June, whereas we were talking about later June before. And he thinks that the, believes, in fact, that the Constitutional Conference and the people surrounding that are coming together at about the right speed, and he believes that'll be successful. He did say he will not be fighting the next election on the old Constitution. Is he absolutely sincere about it? Is he fully intent on the total abolition of apartheid? I had half an hour with him, and I guess that was one thing I and my officials were watching very carefully. Here we are in a room with a man who's at the centre of focus in South Africa. Is he really telling us the truth? And after half an hour of talking backwards and forwards, yes, he is. He's put his head on the line. He knows he's put his head on the line, and I believe he does really want to succeed. The Leader of the Opposition has said that he's cynical about your talks with Mr de Klerk. He said there are people in your party who are itching to restore contact with South Africa prematurely uh, before the rest of the Commonwealth does. Any comment on that? Well, I think that sort of uh, gnashing of the gums by Mr Moore doesn't produce anything, because at the same time when I was in London, I was uh, made an attempt to see Mr Mandela. Uh, unfortunately, he was only there 24 hours and his meeting with Mrs Thatcher ran over time and we couldn't uh, make the contact. But it was certainly, I believe, useful for New Zealand's foreign minister to see those kind of people given the opportunity. And uh, I don't believe that has anything to do with uh, the timetable as such that is set by the South Africans. When do you think we should restore contact? Sporting? Diplomatic, well, political. we have we believe that we should stick with the Commonwealth on this and we've made our position known and it's my view that once those four uh, pieces of legislation are repealed, that then opens the door for the people contact sanctions to be lifted. That means the cultural, the academic, the sporting, provided in fact there is integration in those bodies within South Africa. Well, Sir Robert Muldoon says we should do it probably within two to three months. Is that likely? Well, if the legislation is all concluded by the middle of June, I would say these groups will start talking together anyway. And uh, after all, we may not know if they're even talking to each other, but certainly we will soon know whether or not any particular sport or cultural group or academic group is integrated. All right. Now, is it a good idea, do you think, for Mr Bolger to accept this invitation and go to South Africa himself? Well, that's entirely up to Mr. Bolger, but he but will do you think be. It's a good idea? Uh, well, let's say he will be in Harare at the Commonwealth uh, Prime Minister's Conference, 
and uh, that may well be an appropriate time, but I think uh, you should ask Mr Bolger that question. I'm sure we will. Now, your Anzac Day speech um, caused a bit of a flurry. It was seen as signalling um, the eventual repeal of our anti-nuclear legislation. Was it? No. It should be seen as one of about four speeches I've given which really outlines what I believe New Zealand foreign policy is all about under this new government. Certainly a move back into what I regard as traditional Western Alliance values. But we never Certainly moved away from those, did we? No, I disagree. I disagree entirely. And I'm just coming back from Europe and coming, having been around the South Pacific, there was a distinct view that New Zealand was closing its doors on its traditional allies. Now, whether that view is right or wrong, that's the perception of those who count. The other view is, of course, we want to make sure that when we are talking to other nations and their governments about New Zealand's trading opportunities, we do not want to be seen as some alien country in the South Pacific. We want to be seen as a country that's prepared to pull its weight in this area. Yeah, but does that and mean I, we have to take uh, nuclear weapons into no, that's, our ports? That, you see, you're, you're jumping yes no? the question too fast again. The other thing I really want to convey to the European leaders whom I talk to, don't expect New Zealand to roll over on this issue. Uh, and my point to them was, don't expect us to repeal this legislation because we've got a big majority, which many think we should do. New Zealanders have a great passion for peace. They also have a great passion for what they believe in. And we have been called into conflicts all around the world for the last hundred years, and we go there fully committed. Now, what we're talking about is how do we align our security interests in a time when there isn't a war apparent? But in the case of the Gulf, they saw very clearly that New Zealand is willing to play a part. I don't want to see us misaligned. I want to see us play our part as best as we can, yes, right. but we given can't, the constraints. We can't rejoin uh, ANZUS given the with the anti-nuclear legislation, can we? I'm well, well we're, we're, ANZUS has been suspended at the present time, and certainly the anti-nuclear legislation prevents us playing our full part. I believe that New Zealand can still play a very full part in the collective defence by making sure its alignment with the United States and with Britain is as good as it can get within that anti-nuclear stance on one side and the neither confirm nor deny issue on the other side. So, Minister, do we have from you an unequivocal commitment not to repeal the anti-nuclear legislation? I can not see it being repealed in the foreseeable future. That's not unequivocal. But we have elections coming up every three years, Mr Perigo. That is what is more relevant to New Zealand people, surely. Minister, thank you very much indeed. That frontline interview with the then Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Don McKinnon, was broadcast on 28 April 1991. We conclude this hour with a feature from the Spotlight on Parliament series, which can be found on the New Zealand Parliament website. Koto, ko Kaz Taku Ingoa. Hi everyone and welcome to Parliament. My name's Kaz. And I'm Hans. So just like everywhere, time controls Parliament. But did you know that Parliament sometimes try to control time? That's right. In 1797, the UK Parliament passed a tax on all clocks and watches. Wait, so you're telling me that there was a tax on just knowing the time? Yep. But rather than pay the tax, people just stopped buying watches and instead they relied on publicly displayed clocks like this one. This tavern clock is the oldest clock on parliamentary precinct, dating back to about 1750. It was made by a master of the worshipful company of clockmakers and was highly in demand. So sometimes parliament tries to control time, but mostly time controls parliament. With parliamentary debates and committee meetings scheduled to the minute, how do you make sure that everyone's running to the same schedule? Well, in 1922, parliament installed the system of synchronised magnetic clocks to keep everything ticking over. This master clock kept all the others in sync until the early 1960s. But occasionally, time at Parliament does stand still. Sometimes the government wants to get through more business or move quickly, and the House can go into extended sitting or urgency. Here in the debating chamber, the sitting from the night before can extend into the next day, days, or even right through the night. Outside, time marches on. But inside, the same parliamentary day continues. The calendars in the house aren't changed as they indicate the date of the sitting day in progress. For some contemporary insights into the workings of Parliament, you can view a collection of short videos from the Spotlight on Parliament series. 
just head to the New Zealand Parliament website at www.parliament.nz.